Tom. Thanks for the call. So uh, I'm going to clearly switch over to slides. Um, for better or for worse, there's you know a certain conclusion I'd like to get to, and I kind of have to pick up the speed. And so um, these will be available after the fact. So hopefully that will kind of remedy the a little bit of the issue of, of speeding up. But this allows us to kind of step back a little bit, think about what we've done before, and uh, right. So I had these two the two philosophies for computing Cauchy integrals, possibly. I mean, maybe others. But uh, we had our quadrature nodes and weights. We had our nodes. We had our weights. And then we also had the idea of basis approximation. And this is the, one, the philosophy that we're using. Right? And the, the limiting fact was to be able to compute the Cauchy integral. Was, OK, we approximated f in the basis phi. But to be able to compute the Cauchy integral, I needed a formula for this. And I also need to say precisely what these phi's are. And so I said, oh, well, you should take these Chebyshev polynomials and you should really let the fees be differences of these polynomials. That works really nice. And didn't say this before, but the real reason why, okay, so first your basis is uniformly bounded on minus 1, 1. So this, this is a supremum, this norm is a supremum over minus 1, 1. And then this norm is a supremum over the complement in the complex plane of minus 1, 1. So for j bigger than 2, your Cauchy integral is uniformly bounded for all j. You have really nice, so it's basically saying if this converges to at a, if this converges to f at a certain rate, this will converge to the Cauchy, this approximation of the Cauchy integral will converge to f at the same rate. You kind of preserve convergence rates, and it's just a really nice way to do things. Um, okay, so let, as promised, here, or actually I didn't promise, I told you I wouldn't do this, but here it is. Um, so this is an expression for the Cauchy integral of the Chebyshev polynomial. So this was, this formulation was derived by Xi and Olver. Um, it's, it's quite a mess. But there's a nice iteration scheme you can use to compute all orders. So you start with the zeroth order uh, Cauchy integral and you can iterate through and fill in the remaining. Um, but this was also appeared same kind of philosophy, right? slightly different formulation, was due to Weidemann and Trefeth in, in a earlier work. Okay. So that's still a review. I drew a picture like this before, saying that really in the end what we're going to have to deal with is these finite union of smooths, arcs, and lines. Okay. And then I was able to define last time rigorously in precise detail what I mean by a Riemann-Hilbert problem. Um, I guess this notation is slightly different here. Right? I had, I used, um, that notation last time. Okay. But morally it's, it's the same story. And so then you go through this calculation, which I fit basically did at the end of last lecture, where you arrive at your singular integral equation. And this guy right here is this singular integral operator. Okay. So the biggest uh, theoretical concern for the solution of Riemann-Hilbert problems is the smoothness of solutions of that integral. Right. So the convergence rate of methods, especially because we're using Chebyshev polynomials, so the method is spectral, so it could converge at a rate faster than any polynomial, if we're fortunate. And that will happen, presumably, if the solution is, say, C infinity. So we need a way to understand, yes? When you say the solution is C infinity, what exactly do you mean? I mean, you're talking about analytic functions. So the solution of the singular integral. So it's a solution defined on the curve. On the curve, right. And that so initially you started off with L2. Right. So the, the Cauchy integral of that function off is an analytic function, but its boundary values by no means need to be smooth. And so I'm just going to sketch the components of the theory that go into understanding. So we first have this singular integral equation. I haven't told you anything about the jump matrix. Any, well, okay, we'll assume the contour, we made some assumptions on the contour, but 
I need to specify conditions on the jump matrix for which I can understand the operator is mapping from a space of smooth functions to a space of smooth functions, so then I can hopefully invert it on that space and say my solution is that smooth. And I have to do that, and I need to understand that because that will tell me, guide me to the rate of convergence of a numerical method. With Chebyshev polynomials, if your function is discontinuous, you will not have a rapidly converging expansion. Okay. Right, so what I'm going to define is on each curve, each smooth component contour, we have our L2 functions, but then we also require some number K derivatives to also be in L2. Right. And so not getting into too many technical details, but we just have a function and K derivatives that are also square integrable. And then to construct the space on the full contour, I just take the direct sum of these spaces. And so now every component contour is acting, it exists independently of all the others because of this direct sum. And that's not a good situation. Because if you have a contour that's two straight lines and they intersect, I can have any function I want here that's smooth, any function I want here that's smooth. Now I take the Cauchy integral, they'll mismatch at a corner, and now I'll get a logarithmic singularity coming in. And so this is a condition that lets you capture what cancellation you need to preserve smoothness. And I think a, a good guiding principle is just think about what happens on the real line, but instead of thinking of it as one, one contour or one curve, let's break it into two. So now I have two components. I have gamma one, I have gamma two, and I ask, okay, what's a smooth function or a continuous function? Well, it's a function that's continuous here, continuous here, and has matching values at that point. Okay, what's a differentiable function? Differentiable here, differentiable here, and it's continuous and it's a derivative match. Right. Um, right, I should say continuously differentiable function. Okay, so that's morally what this is saying. It's a condition that becomes more complicated when you have more intersections. So what is a smooth function on this curve, on this contour? You have, okay, so it, a smooth function here should be smooth here, smooth here, smooth here, smooth here, but in what sense should it be smooth at the intersection point? And it's not that it should take the same value from every single direction, that's too restrictive. It's that there's a specific sum condition dictated by these sigma i's which give you the orientation so that when you, you really sum your limiting values from all directions at the intersection point, it cancels out. Which is the same thing as saying limit from the left is equal to limit from the right on the real line when you chop it into two. But it's the generalization of that. So that's the zero sum condition, and you can require it for some number of derivatives as well. Okay? And then you define, so you have your, your HK space, which is functions whose derivatives are also, derivatives of some order are also L2 functions. And then you look at this closed subspace of that, or of functions that satisfy this condition, this zero sum condition, which have this type of, circular smoothness, if you like, at the intersection. Right, so. And then it turns out, yeah. Yes, it's, it's it, yeah, it's, it's a theorem. But, I mean, it's, it's a, it really follows just from sobel left embedding. Um, but the important thing is these, the Cauchy operators, which we said were bounded on L2, they are not bounded operators on this space. Because if I have a mismatch, say, of a function on the real line, and I have a jump discontinuity, it's smooth here, it's smooth here, it misses here, I have a logarithmic singularity, that's not even a differentiable function, it's not going to be an H1 function. Okay? Right, I mean, so it's not only differentiable, but the der derivative blows up terribly at the origin. 
Okay, so this is the important fact. So this turns out to be one of the very nice spaces on which to restrict the Cauchy operator to act. So you take, you preserve the zero sum condition under uh, the action of the Cauchy integral, or the boundary values of the Cauchy integral. I mean, this is clear actually on R, but it's not, it's very much non-trivial on that curve. That if I had, right, so, so I have smooth functions that decay rapidly at infinity and say my limit here is one, my limit from this side is two, my limit from this side is two, and my limit from this side, that I would want this to be. So then this minus that gives me zero, and this minus that gives me zero. This, this would actually, yeah. yeah, so this, that would be, a, let me try to, nicer way, right? So then if I smooth function that has its limits satisfy these values at the intersection point from these directions, and I take the Cauchy integral, that function will satisfy this zero-sum condition, the boundary values that you get away, and it's, that's entirely non-trivial. Okay, so that's a candidate space on which to phrase our integral equation and look for solutions that satisfy all of these conditions. But now I have to get into the jump matrix and tell you I could put in a crazy discontinuous jump matrix into the Riemann-Hilbert problem, and there's no reason why solutions would sit in some H, some zero-sum space. Okay, and so that's where this product condition comes in. And this product condition is in the same picture. A condition, so we have our jump matrix, say G1, G2, G3, G4, defined on each of these component contours, component curves, component arcs, technically. And the, the zero sum condition, or zero, sorry, the product condition here, is condition that as I loop around here, and so the Riemann-Hilbert problem gives me a jump condition across each curve. And so as I jump across here, I pick up some jump, multiplicative jump determined by G. And then as I jump over this one, I pick up uh, a jump that, because of the orientation, will actually be G2 inverse. And then as I go over here, I'll pick up a jump that's G3. And then I go over here, I'll pick up something that's G4 inverse. So if I'm going to go around, have like, non-trivial mon monodromy, and get back to where I started, have no branching behavior, I have to have some sort of multiplicative condition on the jump matrix at an intersection. Okay, and again, a guiding principle is on the real line, okay, you have jump matrix here, jump matrix here, right? Uh, right so you have two different, so let's, see, let's call this zero, so limit Z or S. Right, if G is gonna be a smooth function, Right, and okay, this is, if this is an invertible thing, this is really saying that g of s minus times g of s plus inverse is the identity. So that's the product condition in just the simple, taking the real line and chopping it into two. And it turns out that, at least in our setting, that's the right condition to put down on the jump matrix. It's a, it's a sense of smooth, so you have a sense of smoothness for functions you're going to act on with the Cauchy integral, and then you have a sense of smoothness for functions that determine your jump condition. There's two different types. Okay. Right, and so then this gives us a sense of a, so in, when I use this notation, I'm really referring to precisely the Riemann-Hilbert problem phi plus equals phi minus g, and then phi minus i is in. So the, the f right-hand side function, the inhomogeneous term is zero, 
and then the behavior at infinity is the identity. So when I write that g, well actually it should be g semicolon lambda, uh, gamma, that's what I mean. Right. And so you can go through the whole thing and you can say, okay, if I have this k-regular Riemann-Hilbert problem, I have all my conditions at all my intersection points and I only act on functions that satisfy the right order of zero sum condition, I apply this operator and then I can write down an explicit M, which is actually just an algebraic factorization of the jump matrix. I won't get into the details, but you can just fix up the operator in the right way by multiplication on the left, and you turn it into a nice bounded operator on your uh, space of functions that satisfy the right order zero sum condition. And it, this, this result relies heavily on these two uh, operators. This, this is a particularly kind of important result in the theory of random matrices, or not random matrices, in Riemann-Hilbert problems. Um, there's a lot of existence of factorizations here that uh, are uh, very important. Okay. All right, and I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but you can actually, once you know all these conditions are satisfied, you can write a, assuming you have an inverse of this operator, you can write a very explicit bound on the norms of your solution. So you can get bounds on derivatives. And the convergence rate de depends on the size of derivatives. And so then you can really start to get upper bounds on your convergence rate. And that's, that's, the, big, that's the big idea. Okay. And, but this, to understand this right here, is often a very, very difficult problem. It's really the hardest problem. Establishing these conditions for the jump matrix at intersection points and Getting these bounds is often very easy. This isn't so hard. This is really hard. Okay. And so now, I, mean, I don't have a whole lot of time to talk about the discretization of operators. But let me just describe how the procedure goes. So I told you that to compute the Cauchy integral, you can take, you can do an interpolation. So I, I take a function on the interval minus 1, 1. I choose a nice set of points, which are actually zeros of Chebyshev polynomials. I choose those as my interpolation points. I apply a discrete cosine transform, which gives me an expansion of the function in Chebyshev basis. I convert my basis to the phi j's. I apply the Cauchy integral. And then I evaluate what I get back at those nodes, at those, at those points. Right, so I'm able to go from function value apply the Cauchy integral back to function values. And that's a linear operation, and that defines a matrix. Right? And so that is how you discretize the operator equation, using collocation. Function values, apply the operator to an interpolated function, or a function that interpolates those values, evaluate back where you started. And you get a map from function values to function values. And it's linear. Okay, so... I'm happy to talk more about that whole procedure in the discussion section, but that's what I mean by this. And there's, with, with using Chebyshev collocation, there's a very precise way in which you mean a discretization of this guy. And so there's an extra little bit you need to go through. So we have this zero sum condition, and she and Bolver was able to establish that generically for as long as you have the right order product condition, first order product condition, actually, that if you have a solution of your discretized system and you do the discretization correctly, the solution will satisfy the first order zero sum condition, if you have a solution. So you're, you're consistent. And that's important because, so if, you, if I take a general H1 function, or just a general function that might have some sort of discontinuity at an intersection point, I'll have a logarithmic singularity and I won't be bounded. So I can't even talk about boundary values of this guy unless this UN satisfies the zero sum condition. So I need that to have a precise sense in which I'm solving the problem point-wise at all intersection points and away. Okay. Right. 
right? And so this is, this is really the big, the big point, is the convergence rate is t closely tied to the number of derivatives you have and the size of those derivatives. And this whole framework allows you to estimate the size of the derivatives, figure out on which space of smooth functions should I uh, pose the problem, can I pose the problem, and if it's invertible, what's my estimate on my solution. I'll show you actually in a bit, in a kind of a simplified setting, I'll show you this uh, code in action. Okay, so that kind of tells us, really ties up the story of Riemann-Hilbert problems. So we have a precise sense in which we mean we have a Riemann-Hilbert problem, and although I've glossed over a lot of the details, we have a precise sense in which we can discretize the problem using Chebyshev polynomials and mapping them using the parameterization of the curve, mapping them to different curves. Okay, so I'm going to now show you how you would employ the numerical solution of the Riemann-Hilbert problems along with some transforms, which we've talked about, I guess, here with the Fourier transform, but also more uh, clearly in the discussion section, how uh, employ solution of Riemann-Hilbert problems a lot, along with transforms of the initial condition of PDEs to actually numerically solve them. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if you had, I'll just do a square, but if you had a contour that looked like this, then Actually, what you just need is the function, the limit at this point of the function value from this one should be equal to the limit of function value there. And so it should be, in the classical sense, smooth on that. But that complicates things. And so then here you have a non-trivial statement of what smoothness means. Okay. So... I'm going to redo this for the linear equation and show you how the whole numerical procedure would work in the linear setting. So, I mean, this might be a little bit opaque initially if you haven't seen this before, but hopefully it'll be clarified as I go through that later. Okay, so here is the defocusing nonlinear Schrodinger equation. We have our linear term. We saw that in discussion section yesterday. And then we have our nonlinear term, initial condition, and I want to solve it for all x and all t positive. Okay, and so the inverse scattering transform, you should think of it as a Fourier transform. So I stick in, I have this scattering map, S, which acts as a Fourier transform. I stick in my initial condition and out I get a reflection coefficient, which is in direct analogy with the uh, or a transform of the initial condition. Okay, so I go here, I get this guy, but R actually has time dependence because the PDE has time dependence, and the time dependence is given explicitly in this exponential, just like you would have in the linear setting if you have your Fourier transform. This is a, up to, okay, maybe the factor of four depending on how you scale S, this is exactly what you would see in the integral, in the Fourier integral for the linear problem. Okay? And so now here is a very concrete Riemann Hilbert problem. Right, so I'm looking for a function phi, analytic in the upper half plane. I haven't explicitly stated that the jump contour is the real axis here. So analytic in the upper half plane, lower half plane, jump across the real axis, and this gives you the jump across the real axis. So the time dependence is hidden here, but it's explicit if I wanted it. Okay, and so once I solve this Riemann-Hilbert problem, I compute a large Z limit of my solution of really, so this is, make a little bit more careful, this guy is a, phi will take C, take away R to, C two by two, that's probably hidden. But, so it's, it's a two by two matrix value function, phi is. Question? 
When you did the example for the Fourier transform, you gave an ODE, and it was from that that I could see that it had to be the Z times uh, the associated analytic function that would give me the large limit. Mm -hmm. Here, I just start with the Riemann Hilbert problem. How do I know that that's the limit I need to take? So it would come out of the derivation. Right. So I'm, I'm trying to kind of leap. So there's a lax pair under, under here. So, and that defines a transform. Okay. But for the linear equation, I'm going to write down the lax pair, describe the transform, and you'll s try to draw the analogy between the two. So this, this is the 2-1 entry of the matrix. Right? And so this guy goes to the, morally this goes to the identity at infinity, so the 2-1 entry decays, so I multiply by z to collect basically the residue. Okay. Right, and so this goes back to the 70s. This is really Zakharov and Shabbat, where you have, and using the, whole inverse scattering machinery for uh, NLS. Okay, so there is an important calculation to do, and I think it's really nice because it draws an additional parallel with the linear equation. So we have our singular integral equation here. Let's say we can solve it. We, we have a solution U. Okay. So, well, if I move all of this to the right-hand side, I have a new expression for u then. It's an expression of u in terms of itself, but u exists, right? So I have this expression. So if I assume additional, right? So th this is really going to guide most of what we're gonna do. So we assume k regular, which actually implies g is an hk function, so it's a bounded function, right? means it's also an L2 function, right? But if I assume a little bit more, then, so, okay, U is a solution, an HK solution, which means it's, an, it's more than an L2 solution, but it's not necessarily an L1 solution. An L2 function is not necessarily an L1 function. So initially, when I have just this, a solution here, I know U is L2. But once I'm here, Okay, if this is L1, this is L2, U is L2, the Cauchy operator gives me L2, now Cauchy-Schwartz basically tells me that this term here, L2 function, L2 function, this is an L1 function. And so then you actually bootstrap to something else. You solve it as an L2 problem, and then you learn that your solution is L1. And why do I care? If I take this, I subtract off this, send z to infinity with a condition I stay away from the, the contour a certain amount, I just get the integral of my solution. So the large z limit after multiplying by z ends up just being an integral of the solution of the singular integral equation. And I did this calculation actually for the Fourier transform. When I did that, I had yet basically have a, uh, a geometric series in the integral, and then you apply dominated convergence to say that you can send z to infinity and you just get. You stay away from the contour for contours that are unbounded and. You just so I, it up on the imaginary axis, for example. So it doesn't matter that these contours intersect at infinity? Mm -mm. Right, because your distance, this is not any sort of distance on a Riemann sphere. Just, um, so maybe I'll, I'll write this out. Right, so the, the idea is you have z times integral over some contour. And so then I can write this as right. And then point-wise, as z goes to infinity, this integrand converges to right. And then you apply dominated convergence once you know this is an L1 function, right? So you need that. And I couldn't do that if it was an L2 function. That limit may not exist. 
So there is a precise sense, once you add a little bit more decay of the jump matrix, you can say the solution decays at infinity in a, in a concrete way. And you actually have a, a leading term, 1 over z. Okay, but, so then I like to think of the whole calculation in the following way. What a Riemann-Hilbert problem does, or the inverse scattering, so if you're solving the linear equation, you write down a contour integral for your solution. And so maybe we should... Maybe I should try to describe this real quick. Well, okay, that's the, the end of where I should write. So I did this calculation in the discussion section. Yeah, it's a mu. Ah, uh, yes, thank you. Should be Q. That's right. And what you can check is that cross differentiation it holds if and only if Q T minus I plus Q X X is zero. So this is a lax pair. And so I did the Fourier transform so-called spectral analysis to derive the transform inverse transform pair. But uh, let's see. So with this, you, would, you can do the same thing. But now you use this to introduce time dependence. And I did this. Let's actually write it this way. So out of the analysis of this problem, you find a Riemann-Hilbert problem, which is e to the i s x plus i s squared t q zero hat of s, and then mu should be an element of the Hardy space of off the real axis. And then, with some additional decay assumptions on your Fourier transform, you find that the solution of the PDE should be given by plus I S squared T. You find that. So what you're doing is you use a lax pair. I've hidden the lax pair in the nonlinear setting. You use the lax pair to derive a Riemann-Hilbert problem. So I already did this step. Then from the lax pair, or from the Riemann-Hilbert problem, you solve it. You take a large z limit, and you recover an integral. And that integral gives you your solution. That's exactly what's going on here. But you, so uh, I like to think of a Riemann-Hilbert problem as a or in this setting, the transform is you have to solve a linear system to figure out what your integrand is. It's, your integrand is not given to you explicitly. You have to solve a Riemann-Hilbert problem first to find it. And that induces a nonlinear transform, which is necessary for the nonlinear problem. OK. So kind of speeding along here. So with that in mind, here's the linear problem. Here's my solution I just wrote. How do I numerically evaluate this solution? That's my question. If we just say, OK, this will have some decay to it, but we just look at this guy on the real axis, and here are the real and imaginary parts for some value of x and t. This is a terrible function to try to integrate. But if I do a contour deformation through this guy, which is called the stationary point, it's where the derivative of the exponent vanishes. And I do, so this is down in the lower half plane. I cross at a, basically a 45 degree angle through the real axis, passing through the stationary phase point, and go off in the upper half plane. This is what this exponential looks like. It completely localizes. You turn the oscillations into exponential decay. So this is the steepest descent for integrals type idea. But what I've done is I've turned an oscillatory integrand that's hard to integrate into a smooth integrand that's easy to integrate. And so with this, let me try to 
actually make one more comment before I do something. When we derived the Fourier transform from just this equation, I was able to say that mu plus, let's see here, so, well, even, even it just works here. So if I evaluate this at x equals 0, t equals 0, I'm suppressing the x-dependence, x and t-dependence in mu. I get that. So that, I just get the Fourier transform. Well, at t equals 0, I specify the initial condition. So I have all of the information I need to compute these guys, not from the Riemann-Hilbert side, but from the ODE. So you can actually solve the ODE at from the left, integrating the, the solution that decays at the left, integrate that to zero. The solution that decays at the right, integrate that to zero. Take their difference, and you get the Fourier transform. So you don't have to compute an oscillatory integral. You can solve two ODEs to compute the Fourier transform. And so I'll just demonstrate that. I mean, it kind of requires going through the calculation, but... So I should, before I do this, I should pull up this page. So this is, uh, here's the link, but um, I, it's on, on the slides that I've already shown. But this is Sheehan Olver's Riemann-Hilbert package. And I'm going to demonstrate some uses of it on the left-hand side. And so it's a Mathematica package, and everything you need is on this GitHub page. Okay, so we have to make sure it's in our path. And I'm going to do everything in parallel. So I have eight cores on my computer. I'm just going to parallelize it and show you how that all works. Okay, and so then the first thing I'm doing here is I'm setting a parameter L, which is really a... So I'm going to solve an ODE from minus infinity in, an ODE from plus infinity in, but I'm not really going to do that. I'm going to truncate when the, when the right-hand side of that ODE is less than machine precision at each endpoint. I'm just, you could do it on the infinite interval, but it, I'm not going to. Okay. And so this Riemann-Hilbert package, it involves Chebyshev approximations, much like the Chebfun package that's, that uh, Nick Trefethen and his group have been developing. And so I take my function here, and I create a fun from minus L to zero, and I don't even put in how many discretization points I want. It adaptively figures that out. And then I have my left fun, my right fun, from 0 to L. And then I can put in this derivative matrix, which is a discretization of the derivative. And it will create it with the right, the right dimensions according to the, the fun I stuck in and the right domain. Okay, so let's load that. And then let's just check. So there's a domain integrate. So I, domain, I integrate my left fun plus my right fun. I should approximate the whole line integral. Right. So we see that, yes, integrating these two funds separately gives us the whole line. OK, so now let's set up and solve just the mu x differential equation. All right, so I have my left derivative matrix minus iz, the identity matrix. And this is just here to make sure the identity matrix is the right size. And then I do this and this to enforce the boundary condition, that it decays at minus infinity, or minus L, technically. Okay? And so there, that's what the solution looks like. That's the solution that decays at minus infinity. Notice it's not oscillatory. Right. It'll actually be oscillatory towards plus infinity, but towards minus infinity, it's just a case. Right, so I can do the same thing here and get the solution that goes to zero, solution of the top differential equation over there that goes to zero at plus infinity. Okay, so then what I have to do is I plug in a value of z, I solve the left one, I solve the right one, I take their difference, 
and I compute the Fourier transform. And that's what this here is doing. This is just solving those ODEs in, in a function. Okay, and now let's just check it. So we'll call the stock Fourier transform from Mathematica, right? And notice I'm evaluating on the imaginary axis. So I don't even have to have Z real. I can start doing the analytic continuation of the, the Fourier transform, there's no problem. And then there's my code, giving the same value up to whatever digits you can see. Okay, so now I'm going to try to set up this contour integral and I want to do it not along the real axis, I want to do it along this curve passing through the stationary phase point. So there's my exponent in the integral. There's my stationary phase point. This is a parameter for how far away from the, the real axis I'm going to allow myself to get. And then this is also just another uh, truncation parameter to make sure I don't go too far towards plus and minus infinity. Okay, so I have this function ends, which actually gives me, so here I can define the contour by one, two, three, four points, and encode the contour that way. And that's what ends does. Right. Actually, right, it breaks it up into two pieces. So the ends goes from Z0 up, and over, and it gives me three points to parameterize just the, the part of the contour that's in the upper half plane. And just to visualize it, that's what it does. So it starts at pointer. Right. It starts, this is Z0, goes in the upper half plane. And so then I have another contour, complementary contour that goes down in that way. Right. And then this is a function that constructs this contour. This con using this as a, comp as a piece, it constructs the contour that goes this way up over. And then we have the integral or the, the integrand on that, on that contour. And then you integrate. I saw you the domain integrate command before. So it will do the contour integral along those contours. And that's where you see down here all the domain integrate commands. Okay, so let's just test it at one value. And this is a, a, an important piece of the whole machinery. The, the Fourier integral solution, it takes in x and t. You plug in x, you plug in t, you do an integral. You plug in another x, you plug in another t, you do an integral. So it's, it's completely parallelizable. I don't, I don't need to time step anything. I don't need to evolve. I just plotted a whole bunch of points independently of one another. And so that's what this is doing, is now it's running, computing eight integrals all at once, a whole bunch of points, you know, computing the solution from minus 50 to 100 at time equals 10. All doing this contour integral, passing through the stationary phase points, turning all of this nasty oscillation to exponential decay and localizing everything. Right. It shouldn't take too long. Um, and so while this is going, are there any questions about, I mean, I'm kind of flying through this, but I just really want to give you in broad strokes all the pieces. So this, yeah, so this is all in Mathematica, and Sheehan is, has a, a code called a ProxFun. In the, in the language Julia. So it has been, port, most of this has been ported over, but not all of it. I mean, everything I'm showing you here has been. Okay, so it's done. And let's actually, yeah, okay, so that's how I chose the, right, so that's, that's the solution. That's actually the real and imaginary parts of the solution. And maybe it's actually better to, while we're talking about it, to rerun it. So we see the whole thing, right? And so the, the solution itself, okay, the, the integral is oscillatory and the solution itself is oscillatory. And so this is a kind of a difficult solution to capture using many other numerical methods. But you, you're just doing this integral and you, 
choose your contour cleverly so you never integrate anything oscillatory. You just integrate things that are exponentially decaying and you actually are capturing the oscillations exactly in actually an analytic way because of how you're doing the steepest descent. Okay. We'll come back to that. We'll just let it run and I'll come back. Okay. And so what I won't have time to tell you is how you, stick, stick, st you start with a Riemann-Hilbert problem with a jump G, and the jump G is given this form. RST. Right. And this this guy S zero E to the four I S squared T. Right? So if I group this and this, I basically have the same exponent I had for the linear problem. So I have to do the same thing if I'm going to be able to remove the oscillation from the problem and deform to this this, this type of curve. But, so I deform so something's exponentially decaying. Say this, is ex this part here combined with this is exponentially decaying along a curve. This blows up. This has the opposite sign because of the conjugate. So I'll have the opposite sign and will blow up on that curve. So I actually have to take these two phase, these two exponentials, and pull them apart and put them onto different contours. And that's the most technical complication of doing the steepest descent ideas in a Riemann-Hilbert setting. And so that's what's going on here. As I start there, I have to do algebraic factorizations. I can describe how these go in the discussion section. You pull apart the jump matrix, factorize it in a certain way, and you deform the jump matrix. Just like you deform a contour integral, but now you're doing factorizations and analytic factorizations in your deformation. So it's, it's a more complicated story. But then I solve this guy, I solve this jump here exactly, and I can actually deform yet again and remove that piece. And so now I have something that looks a little bit more like what I showed you for the contour integral. But instead of just having this, now I have that too. I have the upper and the lower curves. Okay, and then there's some other technical bits that you need to get into. You need to work locally because you have actually destroyed smoothness. I won't get into that. Okay, so pictures. So there is a solution of the nonlinear problem. Here's my explicit initial condition, and t is just 50, and you see how highly oscillatory the solution is. And so these are the kind of solutions you can compute when you say, oh, time stepping would be beginning to get destroyed because my derivatives are huge. Derivatives of the solution are huge in there. But I mean, I guess there's a large spatial scale, but still. <laughs> um, and so you actually go to each x and t value and you plot the solution. And it's not a big deal. But yeah, there's a lot of complex analysis and discretization you're working on behind the scenes. Um, there's a similar story for the KDV equation. Okay, so we have now a third order problem, which we also saw in the discussion section last night. But here is the nonlinearity. You have a similar scattering transform. You use your lax pair and you define analytic functions, upper half plane, lower half plane. You, you now have uh, many, it's a second order problem. You end up with many solutions and you have to group them in such a way which gives you rise to a vector or a matrix Riemann Hilbert problem. So here I'm phrasing it as a matrix problem, but uh, there's no reason it needs to. It's, it's really fundamentally a vector problem. Okay. Right, and so now we have a cubic phase coming from the linear term as opposed to a quadratic. And let me just kind of describe to you a complication that arises in the KDV equation and why you might want to be able to use the inverse scattering machinery and the Riemann-Hilbert problem to compute the solution. So this. 
So this first one, this is what's called a soliton solution. So it's just a set squared profile that travels to the right. And what I'm doing is I'm computing this with a periodic Fourier method. I'm just using complex exponentials, uh, just Fourier integrator and just time step. So as this gets to the right, I don't know if I actually have this running long enough, it will wrap around as I've implicitly assumed periodic boundary conditions. It looks like it will. Okay, so as it gets to the right, I've assumed periodic boundary conditions. I'm doing a I'm approximating the whole line problem by a periodic problem. And so once that wraps around, it's clearly no longer a solution of the whole line problem. You know, my solution is completely destroyed once it wraps around. But, I mean, it's pretty good. I can go pretty far in time, and there's not much complication there. It works pretty well. Let's take the exact same initial condition and flip it. And remember, I don't like stuff wrapping around, because then that's the periodic problem, not the whole line problem. Right? It's purely dispersive. And then I get this dispersive wave that immediately comes in from the right. It's high velocity going to the left. And so the, the periodic, doing a periodic approximation of the PDE is a difficult thing to do. I need a huge window so that this wave doesn't reach the left boundary and then wrap back around. Right? So then this, the Riemann-Hilbert machinery lets you plug in x and t, you don't worry about boundary conditions, you solve a Riemann-Hilbert problem, you take a large z limit, you compute an integral to do that, and you plot the solution at that value of x and t. And now that goes off. It doesn't wrap back around, there's no, I'm actually solving the problem on the line. And there's, that window is traveling off to the left, tracking the edge of the, dis, of the highly oscillatory wave. And when this stops, I think it will. Um, just to give you an idea, um, let me pause it first. So this is, you know, t is 18.3. That's minus 10,000. That's out at x equals minus 10,000, and the amplitude is like 10 to the minus 5. Right? So there's non-trivial waves out at x equals minus 10,000. And so if you had a periodic window you were trying to do, these would have already wrapped in a long time ago. Okay, and I just really want to show you pictures. I mean, just different solutions you can compute, and these will, the rest will be solutions of the KDV equation that you can compute with the phrasing a Riemann-Hilbert problem for the solution and then computing with that. Right, so we can take a solution that looks like this. So it's just a dispersive, you have a negative bump, so to speak, for the initial condition, and we have these waves, dispersive tail that goes to the left. Okay, so that's one possible solution. Another one is I actually do a discontinuous jump, and you regularize it in a specific way and you put it all into the framework we've discussed, but you have to do some work. And this is what the solution looks like. It's actually a quasi-periodic solution. You have kind of two phases mixed in, and these are actually tracking some zeros on a Riemann surface. And these zeros actually describe the solution. Um, so it's kind of a nice um, algebraic geometric interpretation of the solution. We don't even need to know that. We just start with the Riemann-Hilbert problem and compute. I don't even need to worry about all of that theory. Okay, so now I take the two Riemann-Hilbert problems and I superimpose them. And now I've done a nonlinear superposition of this dispersive one with this quasi-periodic background. And so you get these kind of wild solutions that don't go to zero, don't go to a limit at plus and minus infinity. Yes? When you say... Uh you're superimposing the Riemann-Hilbert problems. You're saying you take the jump matrix of one problem and add it to the jump matrix of another problem. Yeah, or you're really doing the product of those jump matrices. Right, right, Because right. Yeah, you have an identity jump outside of this minus L to L, and then I multiply the other jump matrix, and I get yeah. Right, and so then this is one that has, you can kind of see two peaks in the initial condition, so then you have the dispersive wave going to the left, two traveling waves to the right, and then this quasi-periodic background. And so 
Let's, let me just end with this last yet. Uh, yes. Yes, it can. It, it shows up, but it cannot be explained with a Riemann-Hilbert problem that's purely on the real axis, as I've shown. I simplified things. There's poles. You have a meromorphic Riemann-Hilbert problem, and you have to do something different. But it, it's, it's to, to get the one soliton, it's actually just a two-by-two two linear system that you end up solving. So it's actually fairly easy. Okay, so this guy is now going to be the KDV equation. But my initial condition is some localized function plus a heavy side. So now I have two different limits at plus and minus infinity. So I've shown you decaying data. I've shown you basically kind of the same average value at plus and minus infinity, even though there was no limit. And now this. And ignore, I mean, so there's a whole lot of work on this uh, going, things are often referred to as dispersive shock waves. Um, so there's all the references, and I will continue on. And so now I've actually done what I just said, and I've included curves for solitons and these traveling waves that appear as discrete, as eigenvalues of an operator. Okay, but it looks the same. But this guy actually has a branch cut somewhere, and so it actually changes the solution significantly. It's no longer as smooth as we're used to dealing with. It's not an HK for every K. And that's kind of a, an important uh, bit. And so you, for technical reasons, you actually phrase two different Riemann-Hilbert problems. I just wanted to put this up there to, so you see the kind of zoo of Riemann-Hilbert problems you get. You have different contours. You have different oscillatory jumps on different pieces on, say, Minus infinity to minus C, I have one jump. From C to infinity, I have another jump. But in between, I have something that actually twists it with this sigma 1, which is this guy. So you have discontinuous jumps, and you have to regularize them in, in, a, in a very specific way. OK, so I've mentioned how, that there are deformations out there. I've really glossed over a lot of the details. Um, but let's just take. Here is our initial condition. So, ah, error function appears again. Um, right, and then this is a solution that travels to the right. So you have a, the whole solution travels with some, with actually a speed 2c to 2c squared to the right, and then so on. Yes. Uh, how many solitons does this generate? Just, just, just zero. Okay. Right. So this is all just from the real axis, there are no, I'll show you one with solitons, with a soliton. Right? And so you can even start with discontinuous initial data. And right? you should be a little bit concerned about the PDE's well-posedness, but well-posed. And this is a slower plotting uh, frame rate. Um, right? And so this is kind of I'm out of time, I'll go to the next one. So here's one that has, so you see the soliton emerge to the right, and then you have this dispersive wave that's still moving to the right, but moving to the right with a uh, smaller speed. All right, and then lastly, this one is now a larger amplitude so as you vary the amplitude of the, the heavy side, you get larger amplitude waves. It's a nonlinear equation. I mean, they get drastically larger, and they move faster to the right. Um, so here's kind of a picture. So as I vary the amplitude of my heavy side, so here's amplitude is 1, here the amplitude is 2, here the amplitude is 3, the leading edge gets farther by t equals 1, and the amplitude is a lot more of these peaks packed in. Okay, and so the, the full long time asymptotics of these is known, but actually computing them with a discontinuous initial condition is a non trivial task. Okay, so I think what I'll do is just the last thing, we'll go back to this plot and let's see what it looks like. Okay, and so I'll stop there. So, can you use Riemann Hilbert? 
problem techniques to uh, when there is X, Y, and T? Yeah, so there are, yes, so for say the KT equation, there is a Riemann Hilbert problem out there. You have these three parameters. And I haven't looked into actually trying to numerically do something with that equation, but, or that Riemann Hilbert problem. In principle, yes. Just the curves that you have to handle. So, what I kind of didn't show a little bit of, but not a lot, is as X and T vary, you have to change all your contours to make sure you capture the oscillation and things don't blow up in the complex plane. And so now if you have three parameters, that bookkeeping exercise is going to be much more difficult. All right. Uh, if there are no further questions, let's thank Tom for a beautiful set of four lectures on this computational theory. <laughs>